Hello everybody, Jeremy Dickinson here. In this video I want to spend some time talking about the philosopher Eric Olson and his theory of animalism. In order to talk about Olson's view, what I'd like to do is read from a short essay that I put together on his view. So I'll go ahead and begin. So philosopher Eric Olson is interested in issues involving what we essentially are. He thinks that we are purely physical things. Accordingly, on his view, we are constituted by anything non-physical, even in part. Olson considers these issues within the context of thinking about our persistence conditions, that is, the conditions that hold for our existence across time. He assumes that we continue to exist through time. For example, we all existed, it seems, five years ago, and we still exist now. We also existed five seconds ago, and we still exist now. So you get the idea here. We can exist across time. Olson wants to know what it is that accounts for our existence across time. He argues that physicalism is right, so something physical about us accounts for how it is that we persist. In his book, The Human Animal, he argues against the immaterialist view of human beings. And so then he goes on in the rest of that book to assume that we're purely physical. So what follows in the essay that I'm reading from after some initial setup, I'll take a brief look at Olson's arguments for the thesis that we are human animals. I will begin by examining his argument for the claim that we are human animals, and then offer one of his arguments for the further claim that we are essentially human animals. Okay. So, section one, setting the stage. What physically persisting thing might we be? There are a couple different major physicalist theories here that I'm, going, that I'm going to discuss. There may be others, but these are the big ones that I want to discuss. The first theory is called the psychological approach, and the second is called the animalism approach. According to the psychological approach, we persist in virtue of our psychology continuing to exist across times. So we all continue to exist through the past five years, for example, in virtue of having the same psychology. We all continue to exist, for example, in the last five minutes, in virtue of our psychology persisting. Keep in mind that it's consistent with changes occurring within our psychology. So our psychology may change as time goes on. But that doesn't mean that the psychology changes into a numerically different psychology. So the, ide the idea is that our psychology is one of the kinds of things that can continue to exist even through changes to it. So this isn't too crazy an idea, I think. Think about your car, your bike, or some other artifact we think that our cars and bikes continue to exist as the same things, though today they're a bit older than they were a year ago, even though the parts of them have been replaced within the past year, or at least some of the parts have changed um, within the past year. So according to the psychological approach, we continue to exist as we do because we have the same psychology. Okay, and this is understood by Olson purely physically. Okay. So our psychology, it may undergo change across time, but it can still remain the same psychology. And it's in virtue of that psychology remaining the same thing that we continue to exist across time. This means that we remain the same, presumably in virtue of having the relevant parts of the brain remain the same. Okay, so if our psychology is understood as a physical thing, then presumably that physical thing is a brain or a part of a brain. Okay. So many psychological approach theorists argue that the higher parts of the brain, for example, the cerebrum, or the relevant things that persist are the things to which we are identical. So they identify a particular part of the brain, the part of the brain that's responsible for higher kinds of thinking, higher forms of cognition. Okay, so that's the, that's the psychological approach. The animalist approach, on the other hand, as can be guessed, is the thesis that we persist in virtue of our animals, or biological organisms persisting. So each of us, it's argued, is undeniably a member of the species Homo sapien. But of course, a Homo sapien is a member of the animal kingdom. It's a human animal. Rather than saying that we persist in virtue of only part of our organism, that is the part responsible for our higher uh, thinking, for example, um, the animalist claims that we are our animals, our organisms, and we continue to exist so long as it does. So we are the same thing we were five or five, five years ago or five minutes ago in virtue of being the same animal. Okay, so those are the two approaches, the psychological approach and the animalist approach that this essay uh, deals with. Now let's look at a series of cases to see if we can um, understand these theories and perhaps start to form some views about which theory 
we intuitively take to be correct. So consider the following case. Jones has had his cerebrum severely damaged from a stroke. Accordingly, all his higher cognitive function have been irreversibly destroyed. Jones will never think carefully about his beliefs again, or his desires, or his values. And he will never have another conversation. Yet his organism continues to function. It's kept, it's kept properly intact. His body can eat, drink, metabolize food, eliminate waste, etc. Here's the question. Is Jones there? Is Jones still there in that body? If you think Jones no longer exists, that he fails to persist, then you reject the animalist theory. This is because the animal is still there. It's intact. This persisted when Jones hasn't. If you think Jones is there, though, and you're a physicalist, then you very well could subscribe to animalism, namely the view that Jones is there because his animal, his human organism, continues to exist, even though there's a radical change that has occurred to it. Okay, so that's the first case. The second case is this. Suppose a surgeon performs surgery on Jones and removes his cerebrum to a distinct decerebrated body, that is a body that doesn't have a cerebrum in it already. The surgeon performs a cerebrum transfer, as it were. Once the transfer is complete, this now cerebrated body acts just like Jones did. Once it, um, it has the same memories, excuse me, beliefs, desires, and values Jones has. It talks just like Jones has. Of course, Jones's organism has been kept alive. It's just now decerebrated, just like the body was, just like the body that his cerebrum was put into. Okay, but the de the decerebrated body it continues to function in terms of its basic functions. So we want to say that, that the organism in there is still alive. So now we have Jones's decerebrated body and his cerebrated body with Jones's psychology. Question, where is Jones? Okay. So if you think that Jones has left his original body, then you must reject the animalist view. This is because Jones's body continues to exist. But as you're claiming, he's no longer part of it. Accordingly, you are likely committed to being a psychological approach theorist because you're identifying Jones with his higher cognitive functioning, his higher thinking, as it were. If you think Jones is now the decerebrated body, on the other hand, then you are committed to animalism, it seems, because you believe that Jones persisted as an animal, not as a psychological entity. Okay, these are tough cases, to be sure, but your intuitions about them are likely to impact the position you want to accept in this debate. I invite you to think them as carefully as you can and be sure to note where you have uh, many, where you have questions about them. And of course, you can always feel free to contact me, J-E-D-I-C-K-I-N at S-Y-R dot E-D-U or J-A-D-I-C-K-I-N at Cal Poly dot E-D-U. Any questions are always welcome. Okay, so let's turn to an argument that Olson gives us for thinking about um, why animalism is true. And the particular thesis that he's going to be arguing for here is that uh, we are human animals. I'm a human animal, and that you are a human animal. And uh, then we'll go from there and look at another argument. So we'll look at uh, two arguments to conclude this um, brief discussion. So Olson's thinking animal argument. Olson argues that we are human animals. His argument relies on thinking about you sitting in, a, in the chair or in a chair. This is just an arbitrary example. He could have used many other examples. For example, you're standing in line for the sporting event you're at, or you're lying down on a yoga mat, etc. Okay. Olson wants us to notice that it seems like a truism to say that there's a biological organism, a member of the species, Homo sapien, in the chair uh, in which you're sitting. And then from the fact, from, from the fact that it and you are thinking while sitting in the chair, it follows that it is right to say that you are the animal organism in the chair. So that last bit captures the intuitive presentation of the argument. Let's see if we can put it in a step-by-step -step manner to help us better understand it. So the argument goes like this. It's called the thinking animal argument. So suppose I'm sitting in a chair. Step one, there's a human animal sitting in my chair. Step two, the human animal sitting in my chair is thinking. Three, I am the thinking being or the thinking thing sitting in my chair. Four, therefore, I am the human animal sitting in my chair. Okay, let's see if we can understand this argument. The main idea of premise one seems to be that it seems true to say that we are human beings. 
that we are members of the species Homo sapien. So when I sit in my chair, or I'm anywhere for that matter, there's a human, a human animal there. Moreover, regarding premise two, it seems that my human animal is thinking. Just as we think that other animals think, my human animal thinks. Of course, as stated in premise three, I am thinking while sitting in my chair. Unless we want to claim that my animal and I are both thinking in the chair. That would say there are two things thinking in my chair. So in order to resist this, the conclusion must be that I'm a human animal. So Olson is clear to note that this argument only establishes that we are human animals, not that we are most essentially or most fundamentally human animals. In what follows, we will see what his argument for, for is for the latter thesis, namely for the thesis that we are essentially human animals. Okay, so let's turn to that argument. So we are essentially human animals. We were once fetuses. Since this is so, we weren't, we aren't, excuse me, essentially anything psychologically. But we are human animals, so we must essentially be a human animal. The previous ideas in this paragraph capture the spirit of Olson's argument for the claim that we were essentially human animals. So here's the argument. Let's call it the fetus argument. Premise one, I was once a fetus. Premise two, if I was once a fetus, then I'm essentially a human animal. Premise three, or the conclusion, excuse me, so I'm essentially a human animal. Okay, what's the support for the first premise that I was once literally a fetus? Well. It seems your mother spoke truly when she said that you moved around often in her womb. Moreover, it seems to be a deliverance of just sound common sense that we were all once fetuses in the wombs of our mothers. Okay, so that seems to support, support the first premise that we were once fetuses. I was once a fetus, you were once a fetus. What's the support for the second premise? The claim that if it's true that I, you, were once a fetus, then I, you, are animals, human animals, that we were essentially human animals. Well, my once being a fetus implies that at some stage of my development, I altogether lacked having mental properties altogether. If I can lack mental properties, then whatever I essentially am is something that doesn't have to have them. My human organism doesn't have to have mental properties. And when I was a fetus, I was a human organism. So it seems that I essentially am a human organism, which just is a human animal. So in conclusion, figuring out what we are, even what we essentially are, is a large philosophical task. Olson is well aware of the fact that most people, including philosophers, disagree with his, the with his, with his theses. Excuse me. Still, in the face of all this, he maintains that his positions on these issues are correct, and that if we think very carefully about what we think is true of us in terms of what we are, then we will see that animalism and all it has to offer theoretically is not as counterintuitive as one may initially think. Okay, so this concludes my discussion, my reading, you could say, of Olson's view on animalism. Be sure, if you have any questions, to contact me with the email information given to you earlier in the video. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for listening. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.